Oh, hello, good afternoon, everyone, and a very warm welcome to today's Lung Cancer Euro Bluetooth webinar uh, on evidence based advocacy, a case study on lung cancer screening, uh, ethical dimensions, and health data. My name is Alfonso Aguanon, and together with my colleague Anina Hentinen, we'll be moderating the session, and it's a real pressure to have you with with us today um, in this in this uh, very very interesting topic. Um, I thought this session is is incredibly important, especially for those of us who are committed to improving lung cancer uh, screening policies through evidence based approaches. And um, so we are going to dive into some key issues surrounding the ethical dimensions of lung cancer screening and how health data plays a pivotal role in shaping advocacy efforts. So before we get started, I'd like to extend a, a big thank you to all of you joining us today. Um, so whether, whether you are turning a space in advocate or a healthcare professional or someone with a personal interest in the in this area, your participation adds an immense value to this conversation. So now let me introduce our two speakers today who bring a wealth of experience and knowledge to the tailor, um, to the table, sorry. So uh, we have with us um, uh, Laura Michel, who is currently a PhD candidate at Q11 in Belgium and is deeply involved in the implementation of Lyme cancers uh, screening programs in, in Flanders. Uh, Lawrence fo will focus on, on, on shared decision making and patient autonomy, and it's essential when we discuss the ethical dimensions of a screening and patient engagement. Also, we have the pleasure to have with us Dr. Theodora Lalova Spinks, which is a postdoctoral researcher at Ghent University in Belgium, specializing in health, law, and data protection. She has a remarkable background in interdisciplinary research, including PhD uh, on cross-border clinical research in the European Union. And her work focuses mostly on the legal and ethical aspects of health data, making her the perfect speaker for today's session on data, data's role in lung cancer advocacy. Um, together, Theodora and Lauren will share their insights in how we can use uh, data and also on the ethical considerations to build stronger and more effective st advocacy strategies for lung cancer screening. Um, as for today's session, the dynamics are going to be as it follows. We'll begin with the presentation. First, Lauren will, will take her part. We'll have a little bit of a time for Q&A uh, around her presentation. Then we'll give the floor to Theodora. Uh, and then we'll also you will also have the chance to make questions to her, and then we'll have a common a space with the two of them, so you can ask your questions directly. There are two main ways in, when, in which you can participate. One of them, if you would like to make your questions uh, through your microphone, you just need to press the button of participate or raise hand, and Anina or me will um, unmute you when it is your turn, so you will be able to make your question live. Otherwise, you can say your questions in writing in by any time, just by typing them in the Q&A or in the chat window. So without further ado, let's get uh, started. So Lauren, you go first. The, the floor is yours. Thank you, Alfonso, for the introduction. Um, I will start sharing my screen now. I think now you should be able to see my screen. Yeah. All right, so again, good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining this webinar. Uh, my name is Lauren, and I'm a PhD researcher working on the implementation of a lung cancer screening program in Belgium with a specific focus on shared decision making. And today I will be presenting on ethical dimensions in lung cancer screening, and I will be exploring how shared decision making can serve here as a tool for addressing these ethical challenges which occur throughout the whole screening process. So let's have a look at uh, today's agenda. So during this presentation, I will discuss a few ethical concerns involved at some stages of the lung cancer screening process, from initial participant recruitment and screening procedures, so the low-dose CT scan and the benefits and harms it comes with, to post-scan reporting of results. From there, I will go over the concept shared decision making, uh, because shared decision making can play a vital role here in helping to navigate these ethical challenges. 
And by ensuring that participants are well informed and involved through shared decision making uh, in their healthcare decisions, we can better respect their autonomy and address their individual needs and values. So let's start off by giving some background on the topic. As many of you know, um, lung cancer is one of the most common and deadly cancers in the world. It affects millions of people and smoking is still the biggest risk factor. But things like environmental exposures and genetics also play a role. And because lung cancer screening has a low five-year survival rate, early detection is really important. Finding lung cancer at an early stage can lead to better treatment options and a higher chance of survival. Low dose, uh, yeah, low dose computed tomography scans have become uh, a key tool here for early detection, showing a significant decrease in lung cancer deaths. For example, the Nelson trial, which was a study from the Netherlands and Belgium, along with other major uh, studies, found that uh, low dose CT screening could lower lung cancer deaths by around 20% in high risk populations. These results highlight the importance of establishing accessible but also ethical screening programs that prioritize the participants' needs. On this slide, um, I've outlined three important steps of the lung cancer process. And as I already mentioned, I will discuss ethical concerns involved in these three steps. And I will start off with the recruitment phase. The recruitment uh, comes, of course, with some inclusion criteria. And inclusion criteria for lung cancer screening are important to ensure that those most likely to benefit from screening are identified. And typically, um, these uh, criteria includes age, smoking history, uh, current health status, focusing on individuals at high risk of developing lung cancer. And by targeting these high risk groups, uh, screening programs can detect lung cancer at an early, more treatable stage, which is first of all very important for overall survival. Furthermore, setting strict criteria is also very important to avoid screening uh, low-risk individuals and th thereby reducing uh, the risk of false positives, overdiagnosis, but also unnecessary treatments and anxiety, which carry physical, emotional, but also financial costs. And presented on the screen, um, you can see uh, the guidelines from the US Preventive Services Test Task Force. These are the crit uh, criteria that are used in uh, America in the screening programs. And as you can see, these criteria prioritize populations with significant exposure to known lung cancer screening factors, such as uh, smokers and ex-smokers. But however, applying uh, these criteria raises some ethical questions about inclusivity. For instance, individuals who have been exposed to other significant risk factors, such as asbestos, uh, passive smoking, or environments with poor ventilation, often do not receive the attention they deserve in these programs. For example, um, asbestos is a well-documented risk factor for lung cancer, and people working in industries uh, such as construction be at higher risk, even if they do not fit into the traditional profile of a heavy smoker. Similarly, those living in poorly ventilated spaces, areas with high level of air pollution or those with a genetic uh, predisposition may also be at increased risk of developing lung cancer, but yet they may be overlooked in those uh, screening uh, programs due to the focus on smoking, smoking history and age. Um, and this clearly shows that we need a more thoughtful approach, approach in lung cancer screening programs uh, that takes into account a wider range of risk factors. Um, it's important to address these gaps so we can create screening programs and strategies um, that are inclusive and recognize that there are multiple reasons people may develop lung cancer beyond just smoking history. Um, research highlights that patient advocacy is key in improving these criteria. Advocates or uh, patient representatives can help by assessing whether these criteria for including or excluding patients make sense and are practical and are useful in clinical practice. By including um, patient representatives, screening programs, but also studies like clinical trials can better meet the needs and priority of patients or participants. And this not only makes uh, such programs more acceptable, but it has also shown that it also increases the chances of 
successfully recruiting participants for programs or for screening programs. Building further on the discussion of inclusion criteria, it is essential to delve deeper into the accessibility aspect of lung cancer screening, especially in the context of socioeconomic disparities. Individuals uh, who meet the current screening uh, inclusion criteria often come from a lower socioeconomic background, and this is largely due to higher smoking rates in these communities. And literature has shown that individuals from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are less reachable, but also less likely to participate in screening programs. Um, this can be due to various barriers, including financial constraints, uh, geographic isolation, but also cultural differences. And to promote equity and accessibility, screening programs must strive to be inclusive. And therefore, it is important to improve recruitment efforts and effectively address socioeconomic barriers. And several targeted uh, strategies can be implemented. Research has shown that two of the most essential components for designing effective uh, interventions are to ask the target population what they want and what they need, while on the other hand, including patient advocacy groups in the creation of interventions at all stages uh, of the design of it, uh, from communication to implementation, uh, evaluation, um, and I will explore these strategies in greater depth in the next slides. So in terms of needs and preferences of participants, we are currently conducting an uh, umbrella, umbrella literature review and an interview study to identify uh, the barriers and facil facilitators to implement and to participate uh, in a lung cancer screening program. Um, so we have two aims or two objectives in this interview study. And the first aim is um, to collect the preferences of eligible screening participants and healthcare providers in lung cancer screening. Uh, and on the other hand, we also want to see how we can implement shared decision making um, in this process. So we want to see what is needed to implement it. How do healthcare uh, providers look at shared decision making? Um, and um, so, as I already mentioned, we are interviewing healthcare professionals who are involved in the prevention, the early detection and the treatment of lung cancer. Um, but we're also interviewing eligible screening participants and we, we are trying to um, include a very heterogeneous group. Uh, and this we are doing by recruiting in various ways. So we recruit uh, by flyers, via healthcare professionals, but we also go to community houses and we talk with community workers and uh, also community uh, members. Um, we also, um, in, in Flanders, um, which is a part of Belgium, we also have uh, a lung cancer uh, screening task force, uh, which is actually a working group who comes together every two months. And the group consists of uh, um, oncologists, pulmonologists, radiologists, but also people from academia, also patients, um, patient organization, patient representatives. And there we, we give feedback, we gain feedback, uh, but we also share it, uh, our results. Um, and although these studies are going, uh, are still ongoing, um, I would like to share some preliminary insights uh, we have gathered so far. So in terms of uh, information, uh, we see uh, during our interviews with individuals from a lower socioeconomic background that they are expressing uh, a preference for accessible information formats, particularly uh, for printed leaflets, um, because some people have limited access to internet or they don't know how to work with a computer. And participants also uh, appreciated videos with spoken text. They say like, oh, it can be displayed here in the community center, in the community house, on the screens, on the, or on the, uh, the TV screens. Um, but of course, there is also a need for uh, multilingual resources, um, resources um, as these uh, centers often uh, serve diverse populations with varying uh, linguistic backgrounds. 
Um, we also um, see that engaging patient advocacy groups in designing these materials can enhance their relevance and credibility. Um, research has shown that materials who are created together with advocacy groups are often perceived as more trustworthy and relevant mm -hmm. and also increasing the uptake of screening. What we also see is there is that there is a, a very strong trust in the community workers from the community members uh, themselves. So working together with trusted community workers or, or the volunteers who work there, who understand the challenges of the members can make outreach efforts more effective. They can share important information about what their community needs uh, to us, but they can also share important information with the members um, so information of the screening and they can help overcome the barriers and build trust to encourage people to participate in screening programs. Um, many people in these communities also have trouble to getting to appointments because they don't have reliable transportation uh, to go to the hospital or easy access to public transport. So of offering shuttle services or transportation supports um, can also remove some, uh, some of these barriers. And lastly, what we also see is yeah, providing financial support like uh, the reimbursement of the screening test, but also transportation vouchers can make it much easier for people with lower income to access lung cancer screening. We also learned that covering transportation costs like the bus tickets or the parking fee can really make a big difference for those thinking about getting screened, but are not fully convinced yet. Let's move on uh, to the screening process itself and the benefits and harms it comes with. So um, while finding lung cancer early with a low dose CT scan can be very beneficial, it also has some risks and raises some ethical questions. One major concern is uh, overdiagnosis. This is where uh, a cancer is found that might never have affected a person's life if it was left alone. And this can lead to unnecessary treatments, unnecessary costs, unnecessary anxiety. And the same goes for false positives, where something looks like cancer but isn't, and also leading to extra worry tests uh, and costs. Um, another issue is uh, incidental findings. Uh, this is when the scan shows unexpected issues in other organs, like the liver, the kidneys, or the thyroids. Uh, because when, when there is a CT scan taken of the lungs, you don't only see the lungs, but you can also see other organs and maybe also other tumors. So these findings can also lead to extra tests, uh, more anxiety and sometimes unnecessary treatments. Um, and this raises a very important ethical question. Should we share every abnormal finding, even if it's not directly related to lung health or even if it's not directly something to worry about? So that's also something very important to clearly communicate to the participants what they can expect from the scan, because in the end they come for a lung check. Um, so for participants to make an informed decision, they need to fully understand the potential risks and benefits. And when they have this knowledge, they can um, weigh the value of screening against the, the, the possible downsides of it and make a choice that aligns with their um, personal uh, values and preferences. So now let's move on to the last part, which is the communication of results. Um, and here I will directly go over to the concept of shared decision making. And what is shared decision making? Uh, shared decision making is a collaborative process between a healthcare provider and a patient, or in this case, a screening participants. And both parties work together to share information and to make an informed choice about a certain health decision. Again, in this case, the, uh, the decision to undergo lung cancer screening or not. And this choice will be made considering the patient's preferences, values and uh, own circumstances. Um, when it comes to communicating results, shared decision making is very important, especially about treatment options. By involving patients in conversations about their results, they gain a better understanding of their health and what comes next. And this opens in dialogue, uh, helps patients feel more empowered uh, to explore their, their treatment options, making sure, uh, sure these choices reflect their personal values and situations. So when providers and patients work together and communicate 
clearly and openly. Um, it also has shown that it not only improves the quality of care, but also strengthens the relationship between them and ultimately enhance uh, the treatment compliance. And this collaborative approach contributes to more ethical and patient-centered practices in lung cancer screening, ensuring that patients feel respected and informed throughout the whole process. Patient advocates like patient representatives can be key in this process. They can help in explaining the results and guide patients on what, uh, on what to do next from their own experiences. Um, the same goes uh, for the decision to undergo screening by providing uh, comprehensive and balanced, informa balanced information about the benefits and risk of screening. Shared decision-making allows uh, patients to collaborate, uh, collaborate with healthcare providers in making an informed decision. This process not only enhances respect for autonomy, but also reduces uh, the decision regrets. Uh, research shows that when patients are actively uh, participating in their healthcare decisions, um, they tend to feel more satisfied and it can, th this can lead to less regret and to more confident decision making and better alignment again with their uh, individual values and preferences. So how can we implement uh, shared decision making? Primary care providers can play a crucial role, including pharmacists and also tobacologists. Uh, they can play a, a crucial role in guiding patients through the lung cancer screening decision-making process. Engaging them can help uh, overburdened uh, general practitioners, especially in, in here in Belgium, where many uh, uh, general practitioners are hesitant about lung cancer screening. They often express uh, concerns about not having enough time to properly inform and guide patients on screening options. But I also do think that advocacy can bridge gaps between patients and providers and that they can also have a role in uh, the decision making around lung cancer screening. So thank you uh, for listening. And if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask them. Thank you very much, Laura. I think it was very, very clear, very straight to the point presentation. So that's that's great. Um, uh, we have a few questions uh, uh, to do to you. So um, Anina and me will be will be doing them. Uh, so the first one is related with, uh, I think, something you were mentioning, and it says while the risk factors like radon or asbestos as were establishing contributing to lung cancer. How would you recommend patient advocates gather evidence on less clear or overlapping risk factors such as occupational exposure or air pollution, which seems to intersect with other advocacy areas? What strategies could be most effective in highlighting these risks? You mean like how can uh, patient advocacy help in, in, in finding those people? Uh, I, I think the, the question focuses more on the fact that there are some certain risks, like, for example, air pollution or occupational uh, risks uh, are overlapping other advocacy areas because there might be other, uh, not just patient organizations, but also some other policymakers or other regulators involved in this. How, how would you suggest for those less clear or more intersectal risk factors how we as patient advocates can gather uh, this type of evidence or how would you, would you really uh, think we can highlight those factors in order to improve the screening programs around those particular risk factors? Um, I think, um, yeah, I think I'm not sure of the question, I'm sorry. Uh, no. <laughs> No problem. I can ask the person who has who has uh, um, who, who who sent that question to refresh it again. Yeah. That, yeah. That's fine. No problem. But I'll ask that. Maybe Anina, you can do another question because there are some others coming. So Anina, you go with the nest, and I will be asking this person if he can clarify. Thank very you. good. Very good. Uh, so I can read from the chat the the second question that was coming in what what is the role of the cardiologist in lung cancer screening um, smokers often present with cardiac problems and can be guided towards screening by them question mark so uh, so i think the role of like um, the cardiologist but also 
other um, specialists can be in creating awareness and not, um, uh, yeah, and being uh, being um, confident that that also their patients can uh, can go through a, a, a lung cancer screening. Um, I think they they really also need to inform them, and that's also something we are doing. In our interview study, we don't only look like uh, at the primary care um, providers, but also to specialists because uh, they see a lot of patients with a lot of problems. Um, for example, uh, heart patients who are also at high risk for um, for lung cancer. Um, so I think they have a, a yeah a specific role in creating awareness. Also in the in the shared decision making uh, process, I think to to guide their 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 patients maybe to do a lung check. Um, so I think that's one of the uh, the roles a cardiologist can have in uh, in lung cancer screening. Thanks a lot, Lauren. And actually, there was another one uh, on the roles. So the other one was actually from the pharmacist side, like uh, what. What is suggested for the pharmacist to help in, in lung cancer screening process? Uh, for example, uh, is there something, can they, they give in flyers or is it even recommended that pharmacists help help overall in, in the process of screening? Have you heard uh, any examples on, on that kind of a thing? Um, yeah, what we see in Belgium, and as I also uh, mentioned in my uh, presentation, is that uh, general practitioners are um, overburdened. They don't have the time to to um, do these um, shared decision or decision making conversations with their patients. So we had to look at different options and uh, different uh, providers who can um, who can guide patients. And uh, we got a lot of uh, feedback also from the from the task force. Why not including tobacologists and pharmacists in creating awareness and in um, uh, in doing the the decision making? So indeed, they can uh, give flyers to participants because pharmacists often stand very close. Uh, to their patients, sometimes even even closer than the general practitioner. Um, they know sometimes what their smoking history is, what other factors are, uh, or other risk factors of the patients are. So yes, they can also create awareness and, and um, do maybe a, a decision making. Thanks a lot, Lauren. Maybe I can go with, with my question as well. Like I, I was actually just wondering, how do you see like with with the future of more data in the decision like in like data sharing in in health systems in general if there if if there is any kind of advances that you can see in the future for for the screening programs uh when when the data sharing is improving within the european union for example um yeah i think theodora can also uh Oh yeah, better answer that. But I do think that uh, it will be very imp important to um, to maybe um, I don't know if this will, this will answer your question, but I think it's very important to uh, put in the the uh, in the the patients um, uh, the the I don't know how to say it the. Um, uh, yeah, the the patient at the. The dossier. The, do you know Theodora the word the dossier? The, um, kind the, of the file, file, patient file. Yeah, dossier. the patient file. Yeah. Nowadays, it's only like the um, the smoking. Do you smoke? Uh, yes or no? And mostly, uh, that's the only thing that is mentioned in the the patient file. But I think it's also important to gather like other information, like um, uh, the health records. Awesome. Um, sorry. The health records, maybe all the, all yes, the medical indeed. history and uh, yes, indeed, more. Yeah, I think yeah. Now the medical history, more or less, it will be shared. But uh, there are other important factors that are nowadays not in the in the in the file, and I think we can improve there um, on uh, yeah on on gaining uh, patient information. But I saw in the chat that uh, that there was mm -hmm. another uh, question on the pharmacist. Um, 
on do do uh, if I know if they're willing to do this. So we did a few interviews with uh, pharmacists, and we see that um, indeed they are willing to do it. And they also say like we sent very close to the patients, and now they already come with some questions from other screening. Um, so in Belgium, yes, or in Flanders at least, they are willing to to help with the decision making. That's great. And, and I see that Gundula has raised her hand. So I'm, Gundula, I'm going to let you uh, unmute your microphone and turn your camera on if you want to make your question to Lauren. So you should have, I think we can see you and we can hear you, I think. Yes. Hello, Lauren. Thanks for your for your presentation. I was wondering, uh, because we have that it, discussion in Austria regarding uh, um, regarding lung cancer screening, that it's very important how you approach uh, candidates. And uh, that if you if you make it wrong, then we have uh, the concern that people get get afraid, you know, to be being diagnosed. So do you have uh, any ideas of how, 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 how are you addressing them? How do you make it interesting for them without fear to participate in these screenings? And is it difficult for you to recruit people in um, that uh, risk uh, community? Yes, first of all, yes, it's, it's very um, difficult to recruit participants and to find participants who are willing to speak about it because when we, we find participants to speak with, we immediately see that indeed there is uh, some anxiety for the results and for potentially having or getting lung cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so yes, and I think how we can, um, how we can um, maybe make them yeah, make make sure they are less um, anxious about it. I think we um, we really need to to inform them very well. But also, uh, for example, we see I think that people from uh, a lower socioeconomic background have less uh, knowledge uh, on the topic and are more anxious about it. So I think they're working together with community helpers uh, or members or volunteers. So people who they trust and um, and yeah, working together with them and, and uh, making sure that they give the right information to potential participants in the community houses can maybe um, yeah, overcome that barrier. Um, yeah, I, I do think it's just very important to give the right information to see that, that the information you give is very balanced and don't make them even more afraid. I think that's very mm -hmm. important also to not um, give too much information, but make it very well balanced uh, and at the same time informing them on all the aspects. Um, but I think, yeah, involving enough people who they trust, um, like their, their trusted GP, their trusted pharmacist. Yeah, I think that's important. Uh, and do you have um... One more question, I'm sorry, but you have a percentage, a number on if you do the risk stratification, how many uh, people are really affected? You know, if you take that risk group, which you lined out mm -hmm. and especially the smokers, you know, because it's it's five, it's four percent of um, the population or zero point four. So how, how much how high is the percentage of uh the people you screen, which are really affected, is it one percent, like the Nielsen study, or is it is it more? You mean like the people we screen in in yes. a study? Uh, the people you screen, how many of them are really affected? How how high is the percentage? Oh, but but uh, we we don't uh, screen in a yeah we don't do a uh, screening yet uh, uh -huh, okay. in Belgium. Okay. So maybe that was not clear uh, mm -hmm, out of the mm -hmm. presentation. But in um, in the University of Antwerp, uh, they're currently uh, setting up a feasibility study uh, okay. or an implementation study uh, on a small scale. Um, but it will start, I think, in January. Um, okay. So, okay. yeah. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And Ilona, I can see that your hand is raised, but in the interest of time, if you, if you don't mind, we'll go with Theodora's presentation and we will keep your question uh, right after her presentation. So right now, uh, thank you so much, Lauren. Uh, right now, I'm going to give the floor to, to Dr. Theodora Lalova. She's going to uh, talk us through, drive us more around the key issues around health data and regulation. So, Theodora, the floor is yours, so you can share your screen when you're ready. I think we can see it, enable your webcam, and uh, yeah, there it is, and the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alfonso. Uh, great to, to be today with you, everyone. Thank you for the invitation, and thank you, Lauren, for the great start and the presentation. So on my side, uh, my plan to follow up after Lauren was to introduce you and to open up a little bit of a discussion about the use of health data, both in terms of lung cancer screening, but also beyond uh, for you as uh, uh, evidence-based advocates, but also for you as individuals and citizens. So I'm going to discuss, um, discuss this topic from two perspectives, uh, always keeping the two perspectives in mind, the research-oriented perspective and how uh, we should work, all of us, with data when it comes to creating evidence-based uh, publications and searching for more knowledge and publications, but also what should we know uh, as patients and individuals in terms of our rights uh, when it comes to our health data. So in my presentation, first I'm going to focus on data protection, what it means, what are the rights, the obligations, uh, what is important for you to know as advocates. And then I'm going to go into a new regulation, a new law that has a lot of promise for potential to bring opportunities uh, for patients and individuals across Europe in the coming uh, 10, 15 years, really the future, uh, both in terms of how healthcare is organized and data is used cross-border, but also in terms of research uh, and potential for new research, policy making, innovation, uh, and so on. So starting with data protection, what, what it is, uh, what it means for, for us. So uh, perhaps you know um, it is a fundamental right. So we have heard a lot uh, also in the media about the general data protection regulation, the GDPR. Perhaps uh, in your professional lives you have uh, bumped into it in one way or another or as advocates as well. And there has been a lot of discussion, but also a lot of misconceptions in terms of the general uh, data protection regulation, uh, blocking research uh, or uh, being a challenge to, 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 to overcome. What is important to, to know, uh, it's also a little bit dispelling some of the myths, uh, is that the GDPR uh, and also the National Data Protection Acts in each of the European countries, they embody a willingness, a spirit to work with and to share personal data. But of course, they're also safeguarding uh, our rights as individuals in terms of how our data is protected. Uh, so it's two very important objectives, uh, and we see them both into the law. Uh, the law also provides rights and obligations uh, to all involved stakeholders, all involved actors, uh, both to the people using the data, sharing the data, accessing the data, but also when it comes to the people whose data is being used. Uh, so each of us as individuals, our personal data, we have certain rights uh, towards it. Very important to, to, to keep in mind, actually, when we discuss data and health data is, first of all, what is personal data. So what is being the subject of so much discussion and protection and so on? Uh, the definition under the law is any information that relates to an identified or identifiable natural person. Uh, so uh, the legal technical definition and the concept that it speaks of is data subjects. So all of us, we are data subjects. Uh, and such data, very simply, could be uh, our names, uh, our addresses, uh, our photos, uh, our phone numbers, anything that allows to be identified who, who we are. So already on this call, I can see your names. Uh, technically, I see, I know who, who you are. But also uh, important to know is what is not personal data. So, for instance, aggregated statistics, uh, the number of inhabitants in a certain country, like in Belgium, having 10 million people living here, knowing this information, uh, this is not personal data. We cannot identify who specifically lives in Belgium by knowing that we have 10 million people. Um, the law gives even more protection, special protection, to so-called special categories of personal data. 
And this is, you can see on the slides, it's, uh, it's a specific list uh, of such data that deserves such higher protection because of the attached risks that come when we use it. And here you can see especially genetic data and data related to health. So anything about screening, uh, anything about uh, test results, blood test results, diagnosis, uh, anything relating to, to your health status would be uh, receiving such higher protection. What is also interesting to, to keep in mind, uh, especially when, for instance, as advocates, you do a survey. Let's say you have uh, prepared an online survey and uh, you're disseminating it uh, in your community. Um, and it would be important to know, is it actually the GDPR applying to it or not, to the data that you're collecting? Um, and we have two special categories of data that we need to, do, to differentiate. On the one side is anonymous data. So this means data through which we cannot identify an individual. So any possibility to trace it back to a person, it's not there. For such fully anonymous data, the GDPR does not apply. The law does not apply. We don't need to worry about it. But on the other side, if we have pseudonymous data, so data that uh, in some way we can still trace the individual. Perhaps, let's say, uh, in the survey that you're doing, you're not collecting names, but you're collecting email addresses. Uh, or let's say um, you, have, uh, you have collected the names and then you have deleted the names and you have replaced them with a certain type of number, a code. So instead of saying uh, Theodora, you're saying uh, patient number two. It is still possible to find out who patient number two was perhaps through a certain list that you're keeping, a key that you're keeping to identify. If this is the case, the data is pseudonymized, but not anonymous, and the law applies, the GDPR applies. What is very important uh, in case you're the ones that are using the data, so-called processing of the data, collecting data, storing it, and so on, is to keep in mind that the law uh, establishes a system of data protection principles, related to them certain obligations uh, that you have to, to fulfill, to follow. And this is also on the other side important for you uh, as individuals to know what protection the law gives you and what type of uh, obligations it puts to the people using the data, uh, which could be, for instance, uh, your doctor. It could be uh, the company that is uh, doing a clinical trial in the field of lung cancer. Uh, these different um, entities would have certain obligations to follow. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm not going to present all the principles now, always happy to discuss uh, later, but I'm going to give some specific examples to, to make it more tangible. For instance, uh, there is the principle of lawfulness, uh, which uh, one of its expressions means that whenever we are using data, there needs to be a legal basis, a legal condition that allows the use of this data. Uh, and the law provides uh, several different uh, conditions that we could rely on. For instance, uh, the consent of the individual, that their data is going to be used. Uh, or let's say we're performing a task in the public interest, uh, which could be conducting scientific research, but there is a lot of other uh, discussions around that. Uh, or let's say the protection of the vital interests of the individual. That would be the case, for instance, when uh, uh, somebody, somebody needs to receive urgent medical care, they're unconscious, there is no way that we could ask for their consent, but the use of their health data, knowing about their health status, their health conditions, it would be of their vital interest to be used by the healthcare professionals. So that would be the legal condition to, to rely on. When it comes to special categories of data, such as health data, there is also an additional condition that should be uh, taken into account. The law actually prohibits uh, the use of such data unless we have such an additional special condition and it provides a list of conditions from which to, to, to choose and to rely on. Uh, no worries for you to, to, to know now by heart uh, the specific conditions, but I find it important to be aware of how, the, how it works, how the system works. Also, I thought it would be interesting to mention uh, a little bit a note uh, to be careful about the consent and what consent means. So for many of you, perhaps you're aware of consent in a different uh, 
case in a different situation, uh, consent for treatments, for receiving treatments, or consent for participating in research, let's say agreeing to participate in a clinical trial. Uh, this consent is different than the consents under the GDPR for the, for the use of data. Uh, and it is important to keep in mind. So, for instance, um, the, the consent under the GDPR, it has to, 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 to respond to some very specific conditions in order to be real consent, to be valid consent. And actually, it's not always the best legal condition on which to uh, base uh, a study uh, or to base um, the, the use of data for a study uh, for, or for a different uh, purpose, different aim. So, just bring it here to, to keep in mind it's two different concepts, two different consents. Uh, and this oftentimes, of course, could be confusing, could be a challenge, both for practitioners and as well for patients when they're uh, faced with both. So a lot to discuss on this. Um, also important to, to keep in mind is that the, the law itself uses uh, different terminology uh, for um, entities, for the individuals whose data is being used, uh, uh, or for the entities who are using the data. So then what we typically know in everyday life. Uh, for instance, um, so-called data controller, very important to, to keep in mind, is the person or entity uh, which is responsible, which is de really deciding why are we using the data and how we're using the data. So, for instance, a patient organization would be a data controller uh, in case they are doing uh, a survey about a specific subject that they want to know more information about. Uh, they're deciding, they, they determine why they need to do this uh, survey and they need to also decide how to do it, perhaps online. Uh, or perhaps they're going to collect the information via paper forms uh, disseminated in hospitals. So all of the related obligations uh, under the law would apply to the patient organization as a data controller. Another example would be uh, a hospital treating patients, uh, providing treatment to patients and using, uh, uh, storing health uh, records, information about the patients, they would be a data controller. On the other side, we also have the, the, the figure, the concept of a data processor. So that would be an entity or a person who is using the data on behalf of the controller. To make it more concrete, that would be, for instance, an IT company that uh, helps very concretely with the storing of the data, um, with the, the measures around how to keep the data safe. They have access to the data, but they're not the ones deciding why to use the data and how to use the data. So they have obligations, but the main responsibility falls on the controller. This is uh, on this slide just to give an example of the types of obligations under the GDPR that uh, a, a controller uh, or a processor could have. So, for instance, uh, they're responsible and must be able to always demonstrate compliance with the law, uh, keep a record of the type of activities, processing activities uh, that they have with data, cooperate with authorities and ensure data secu sec security. And uh, very, very key for, for all of us uh, and uh, for, uh, as citizens, as individuals, as patients, uh, is the fact that we have um, uh, certain individual rights, so-called data subject rights, that we enjoy in respect to our personal data, including our health data. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them, uh, but just to give you an example, for instance, the right to be informed about the use of our data, by whom, uh, for what uh, purpose, for what goal. We have these rights and it should be always information shared be before the start of the collection and the use of the data. Uh, or let's say the right to access uh, our data. So very practical example to request a copy of uh, our health data being from our health records, being from a, uh, some type of um, test results that we have gone through, uh, or being uh, very, very uh, everyday example when it comes to uh, mobile health apps, uh, smartwatches and so on, having the right to request a copy of everything that is uh, in this smart uh, uh, watch. Uh, before I move to the topic of the health data space, I wanted also to bring um, the discussion around patient empowerment and data control in, in, in view of uh, data. 
So uh, Lauren already touched a lot when it comes to patient empowerment uh, in a more general sense in terms of really identifying and meeting the needs uh, of patients in healthcare um, uh, and in research and what role patient advocates could play in that, specifically related to lung cancer screening. But intertwined with it is also this notion of data control that is very key to data protection and how our personal data is being used. We don't have a definition of data control, but one way to look at it would be to the possibility at a very granular level to decide to exercise control over how our data is used. And this we could do on the one side through individual measures, individual tools, which would be our rights that I just showed, the right to be informed, to, to access our data, to object to the use of our data or to give consent. But it could also be through collective tools, which personally, the way that I see it is really the involvement uh, sometimes of representation of patients, uh, patient representatives in the decisions around sharing data, access to data and so on. And this we're going to see more concretely when I speak now about the health data space. So what is it? Uh, basically, it's a new law. It's a new European uh, regulation that uh, we uh, uh, we're hoping to see uh, officially adopted as of beginning of next year. And it has several very key objectives that are going to impact uh, on healthcare and research uh, and patient advocacy for the years to come. On the one side, it aims to improve control of individuals over their electronic health data in the context of healthcare. So this includes receiving healthcare, uh, it, it includes screening, it includes anything to do with care. Uh, on the other side, it aims to better achieve other purposes, such as research, so to allow more data to be accessible, to be used, uh, innovation, uh, policy making, and so on. And finally, uh, a key objective, especially for us uh, on the legal side, is to present a uniform legal but also technical framework uh, for data, for access to data in the scope of the health data space infrastructure. Two key um, concepts that the health data space talks about and provides rules about is so-called primary use and secondary use of data. And I'm going to very briefly introduce you what the health data space means uh, by the two. Primary use of data, this is the use, the processing of data for the provision of healthcare. And here the novelty that the new law will introduce is actually strengthening the rights of individuals. So the rights I showed that the GDPR provides to all of us in the context of health data use uh, would be specifically strengthened when it comes to healthcare. So it would be easier to access your health data. It would be easier to share your health data with professionals across the whole European Union. It would be easier to add information and to rectify rare errors in your files. It would be possible to also restrict access, perhaps, let's say, uh, to certain professionals that you'd prefer not to, to be able to see your whole medical file. Uh, and it would be also possible to uh, have um, results shareable, uh, e-prescriptions shareable in, within a European health records uh, format. We'll see this is still being built upon. We'll see how it's going to, to look like. I wanted to also make it more tangible with a concrete real life example, what it means, what it would mean to have the health data space for primary use. Uh, and here the example that I that I bring is uh, imagine a patient that is living in Italy and is traveling to Spain for family uh, for holiday. Uh, it happens that they would need to visit a doctor in Spain. Classically, at the moment going abroad, uh, we have of course the language barrier. We have of course the impossibility to sh to share our. Uh, home health records with a doctor abroad, but with the new rules, with the new framework, with the new infrastructure, the doctor in Spain will be able to see the medical history of the patients and prescribe medicine. When the patient goes back to Italy, to their home country, all of this prescription inf information uh, would be visible to their Italian doctors uh, or also anywhere else in the EU if they move further, if they travel further and so on. So very practically, uh, it would make things much more easy uh, in, the, in the long run. This is still being built upon, curious to see how it's going to, to, to look like. 
Then secondary use of data. Um, this is actually the use of data for uh, purposes such, such as scientific research, policy making, regulatory activities, education, teaching, training, and so on. Uh, it is a specific list that the health data space provides of such permitted activities for which it would be uh, possible to um, for different uh, entities to uh, request access to data from across the union, from across um, uh, all the uh, member states. What would be new and very interesting, uh, and where I also am going to give some examples where to, to keep an eye um, on the developments uh, and to keep an eye how you as, uh, as uh, patient representatives, as advocates can be involved, is the fact that we're going to see um, new public bodies being elected in all the uh, European countries, uh, the so-called health data access bodies who would be responsible for uh, providing access, so giving uh, data permits to data sets uh, across the union. So uh, we would, we're going to, to be speaking, it's again to, to novel concepts perhaps about data holders and data users. Data holders would actually be obliged to provide access to the data that they hold. It could be hospitals, it could be researchers, companies, and so on, uh, in case certain conditions, important conditions, have been met on the side of the data users. So again, other researchers, other hospitals, other institutes that uh, have justifiable reasons to have access to the data. Something else very important to keep in mind in terms of empowerment and in terms of uh, control over your own data. The, the new law provides the possibility that individuals, citizens, patients would be able to opt out from the secondary use of data. So they would be able to opt out uh, that their data is not uh, used for uh, research, policy making, training, and so on. They would be able to do it at any time without stating reasons. And this decision, very important, is reversible. We, all of us, can change our minds if we do opt out. Um, so what I find for myself very interesting, it could be also a challenge to discuss and to reflect together, uh, is um, what would be the risks if many people opt out, uh, let's say perhaps biased data sets uh, or perhaps in terms of the representativeness of, of data that we, we need for research, for policy making. And here it would be very crucial in terms of how do we bring just into the system and how do we inform about the new system so that we don't see suddenly a flux of opt-outs from citizens. Uh, here are some examples of uh, what the law itself mentions about role for patient representatives and what I think it would be very uh, interesting for you all to, to, to keep in mind uh, and to, 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 to think about. So first, these health data access bodies uh, that I mentioned that would be responsible for giving access to, to data uh, in the new infrastructure, uh, they, they, they're going to be obliged to cooperate with the representatives of all the relevant stakeholders. So healthcare professionals, researchers, uh, pharmaceutical industry, and so on. But especially the law highlights the importance of cooperating with patients, with patient representatives. So we were going to see how this is going to look like in practice. Uh, currently, countries are starting to build the health data access bodies, but it will be something that we see in all the European member states. Another um, new, again, institution to keep in mind in terms of representation uh, will be the European Health Data Space Boards in which there are going to be representatives of the member states when it comes to topics both on primary and secondary use of health data, the European Commission and observers. And these boards, it's it to be a EU level body, would be complemented by a stakeholder forum, which gathers again representatives of all the relevant stakeholders when it comes to healthcare and research, including, of course, and highlighting patient organizations. So again, something to, to, to keep in mind. With this, I conclude my uh, presentation and I look forward to your questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Theodora. It's, I think you did it great to, to summarize such a complex and, and comprehensive uh, 
thing in such a short time. Um, I'm going, I, I'm very conscious of, st of time uh, before I pass some questions that I received in Brighton. I'm going to open the microphone and the camera to Ilona, who was there uh, before. So just a second. Uh, yeah, I think that you go, Ilona. I think we can hear you now. Yeah, hello, good uh, afternoon, everyone. So thank you very much for this um, call. I appreciate as we are as a new member. So I'm very curious to to exchange the experience. And actually, my it was more, my was like um, uh, my own experience because we have a national screening program since 2022 in Czech Republic. And uh, now in uh, November, we are running a campaign to inform the population about this possibility. So actually we don't need to really like target. Uh, it's it's a national program from everyone, uh, current smoker or um, former smoker, 55, 55 plus. And the biggest challenge is that the, the more than 50% refuse that. Refuse it because of the, of the um, uh, anxiety or the, the actually to be afraid of the result so i was like more about to ask anyone having the same experience with already running programs screening program was the best practice but probably will be another webinar so i will be uh, happy if anyone would like to contact us because actually now we have a one year of the experience of that talking to all these um, um doctors and, and stakeholders and, and how to improve that. We have all, all uh, hard data and we have uh, ordered two years running screening, but still it's uh, it's encouraging because of course, more and more people is getting in the program is the pilot, it's for the five years. So once the people step in, so they, they are monitoring fi for five years. And um, of course, one of the things that the people should consider to quit smoking one of the things that, of course, stop them to go to the screening, and it's it's a national program, so so it's there's already established guidelines for that, and we are constantly talking if to shape it how somehow because we see the reaction of the population. So I was curious to know if anyone has the same experience because I know there is a very few countries already adopting the national screening program. Thank you. Thank you, Ilona. I was also, thanks for earlier also changing messages on this, and I'm sure that maybe in the future on on uh, the education and capacity building program, we would be interested uh, to, to, to hear about your experiences better in Czech Republic. But indeed, uh, Ilona asked if, if anyone, any other countries already having the screening programs and if, if anyone wants to share their experience. I'm probably not sure in, in here, but I know that in one of the webinars that we held specifically on the screen, there were some comments around that. In any case, Ilona, we can be in touch with you right after the webinar and share some of these of these uh, information, also some contacts uh, who I know were very interested in this topic as well. So, so we'll make sure to contact you after the the webinar if that's okay. Perfect. So, um, thank you. The, the, yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Elena. So uh, a question for you, Theodora, uh, around the secondary use of health data that you were mentioning. So the question is, uh, Kevin says, with a growing focus on secondary use of health data for research and policy making, how we as patient advocates ensure that the voice of patients are adequately represented in these decisions? Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for the question. So that is, um many many different ways that we could discuss that uh, i'm going to give um, one example uh first with uh, ethics committees that at the moment or data access committees in in each country is arranged differently but uh, many ethics committees also provides um advice on the one side not only about the um the integrity of the studies and how to you know how best to do to do the studies but also in terms of the data uh, and some countries have it in their law that an ethics committee needs to approve a new study that is only based on data a data driven study so uh it depends on country by country but oftentimes in the composition of the ethics committee it is necessary to have 
a patient on the boards uh, to represent the patient view. So that would be a very concrete example of involving the patients in the decision, in the decision making of do we approve a certain study or not? Do we approve a certain type of secondary use or not? Uh, this we could see also examples, but it's again very different country by, by country in terms of data access committees, which would serve specifically dedicated function to allow the use of data or not. Um, we saw it also with secondary use of data with the health data space that there will be, I suppose, uh, mostly like in, a, in terms of strategic decisions uh, in the health data access bodies, the need to consult with the different stake stakeholders, including with the patients. So this is uh, one way. Another way that I think it would be very, very key, especially now that we're seeing more discussion starting around secondary use with the health data space, is in terms of the engagements and bringing, building awareness in the population about what it means. Um, making it accessible to people and, of course, in terms of the trust, um, bringing this information from the patient organizations, from the advocates, that would be a key, key way to, on the one side, to follow all of the discussions, the policy discussions, and on the other side, to be the bridge with the population itself. That, of course, not every individual, not every patient in their daily life has the, the willingness and the interest to follow all of these discussions, but we need to bring this information uh, to them. So this is just some examples and happy to, to, to elaborate further. Yeah, and, and if I may, I think the, the all the questions that I have for you here, I think it's kind of related because you mentioned this this figure of the like let's say the lay person within the ethics committee or which may add that the patient representative or the patient advocate. And the question that would come in from the audience is, as a patient advocate, how do we balance the potential benefits of secondary use of all data for research with the concerns that some patients may have regarding their privacy and the data security. Do you have an, I know it's a tricky question, but do, do you have like how, how or some tips for an advocate on how to leverage these benefits versus the risk of, of data privacy and, 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 and data protection? It's it's a very good question. It's a, a challenging question. That's something that's uh, uh, everyone in the in the system, from the policymakers to the doctors to the researchers, struggles with. Because of course we want to share and to have access to data and everything. That's uh, when we go to the hospital, what we benefit as patients from the from the care there. It steps on years and years of knowledge and on years and years of data and sharing of data. So uh, everything that we benefit from comes from patients before us sharing uh, and being willing to share and being willing to participate in studies. But of course, we cannot disregard that there could always be a potential risk. What the system as a whole, so on the one side, for me, is the responsibility of the system as a whole to ensure the security of the data, the, the, to make it difficult for data breaches, for data leaks, for, uh, you know, the, the, the companies, the researchers to protect themselves from from scandals that we don't want to see that in, in media and to, to make it as safe as possible. And on the patient's advocate side, out for me, it would be uh, the role of being vigilant about that, the role of um, also bringing the awareness of the importance of, of the sharing of data. And we see a lot of studies about that. People are willing to, to share their data and people, are, we want uh, all of us as individuals to, to, to help research and to help improvement. But of course, why our rights are, are safeguarded. So there is a lot of ongoing ongoing di discussion uh, at the moment in Belgium. Uh, I'm part of a transdisciplinary project, uh, the Symphony of Us, in which as a team we're investigating the concept of patient value in oncology research. And one of our studies is dedicated to patient value in terms of health data, uh, health data reuse, access and how to, to, to protect uh, and how to navigate the system better. Uh, and we're now conducting the, the interviews with different stakeholders, including reaching out to uh, soon to patient organizations. So one of the things on the agenda to, to discover and to, to, yeah, to keep everyone uh, in, informed about the results. Uh, yeah, absolutely. And I think this gives a lot of food for thought for uh, thinking about probably one hour is just a little time for all the kind of discussions we can have around that and all practical ideas. So yeah, absolutely. I'm very conscious of time. Not sure, I mean, if there was any other, any other question or whether we are, whether we are fine before bringing the session to a close. 
I think at least in the chat we don't have any other questions. Okay, for, for yeah. the QR. Okay, no problem then. I, I know that there were a few more, but probably I can pass those because I'm very conscious and I want to be respectful with, with, with your time. So as we come to to um well, I, we can see that there are some people thanking for for your uh, particip for your presentation uh, in the chat. And as we come to an end, I, I would really like to to take a moment on behalf of Luce and also on behalf of Aline if you allow me and say a, a big thank to you both, Lauren and Theodora, for your excellent present presentations and and sharing your insights on online cancer screenings, the ethics, the data. And I think it was truly valuable to hear your perspective and learn from your expertise. And I'm pretty sure there will be more opportunities to collaborate and to explore more in depth uh, on this such an interesting and relevant topic. I would also like to, to thank everyone who attended today's webinar. Um, I think your participation and engagement mean, means a lot to, to us. This, there's been a great attendance to this, to this webinar. So for those who who missed something or would like to to watch the webinar again um don't worry the session has been recorded and will be shared on our youtube channel uh, next monday on the 4th of november so you'll receive an email notification with the details and we also uh, would like to encourage you to stay up to date to our upcoming activities by following us you know where you saw social media channels like Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn, and uh, because there are plenty of exciting things lined up, so hopefully you can you can enjoy that. So with that, again, thank you so much, Theodora. Thank you so much, Lauren. I wish everyone everyone a great evening, and uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future events. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Have a nice evening, everyone.